a uh, bed uh, with some, uh, some school books and some money to go and buy a ticket. So he just went to the train station, bought a ticket. The train station, the, the, the train was infested with uh, this uh, Polizei, the, the train police that was just going up and down the cars with their attack dogs. And I was very surprised to be able to find a picture of that on the internet, looking for Jews. Um, but he made it safely to Chortkov and went back into the ghetto and uh, managed to uh, take care of his, uh, of his uh, family or whoever was left for uh, another few months. June 1943, June 18, final liquidation of the ghetto. The Nazis decided to uh, eliminate the ghetto. Five in the morning, uh, Gestapo people barge into their home and drag them out. It was him, his baby brother, his old, his old sister, and his, and his mom. And they took them to uh, the market square. And on the way, they already saw uh, dead bodies of people who were beaten to death and shot to death on the spot, you know, scattered all over. And his baby brother was asking his mother, what are, you, what are they going to do to us? Now, wh what they were going to do to them was take them to this execution site right out of town uh, next to this unfinished uh, airport that the Russians had built. Um, mass graves, you know, uh, ditches were already uh, pre-dug and uh, it's either in this area or this area. Uh, everyone was just shot to, to death and, and uh, dumped into these uh, mass graves. Um, however, the fact that this gentleman is here tells you that, you know, he has a slightly different story. They got on, on uh, the, the, the Nazis brought the trucks and ordered everyone to get on the truck and to sit low and look down. His mother looked him in the eye and she repeated in his ears the name of her sister who um, lived here, lived in Long Island. And she said, tell her everything. And then uh, she gave him a signal and he jumped off the truck and started running. Um, two Ukrainian guards uh, who stood there uh, tried to, uh, to uh, shoot at him and uh, he, he did get injured from some ricochets in his leg but uh, nothing too serious. So, so, so he kept running and he uh, made it to the river bank. Uh, okay, this is the Sarat River. Looks like any other river. Um, and uh, he couldn't swim. He couldn't swim to save his life, as I said before. So, and he heard all around him, you know, gunshots and people yelling and screaming and shouts in German and dogs barking. And he looked around and he found a wash tub. It wasn't this one, but a wash tub. He said that the one he found was actually slightly bigger. He put it in the water, jumped in, and paddled with his hands out to the other side of the river, got into the bushes there. Um, and just stay there for the rest of the day looking at, at whatever was happening on the Chortkov side of the river. Next day, just got up and started walking. And he decided to walk. He didn't have you know, enough of ghetto experience. He went to the town of um, Kupichinse, where, th where there was another Jewish ghetto. And he hooked up with some orphans there. And that was like the next day. And they... Uh, stayed together and decided to go to sleep and he volunteered to stay, walk, to stay guard. Um, and the kid who was supposed to come and, and uh, replace him didn't show up and he decided that, you know, the hell, I'll just stay all, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, keep watch all night. And then just like it was in short he started hearing this familiar sound now of dog barks and gunshots and he realized what was happening. He, uh, he broke the window of the room where the kids were sleeping and, and yelled, run! And he jumped off the wall and started running towards the Nazis who were closing in on them. And he managed to, to uh, squeak through two groups of, uh, of Nazis and continue to run uh, to the wood. For the next several months, he uh, lived in the woods and uh, on the fields. You know, the wheat was... Uh, tall so he could uh, just you know find refuge on the field he could you know steal a potato here and there um, to eat it was just like a hunt, uh, like a hunted animal he says that if he had to go to the bathroom he would you know dig a, uh, a a ditch do what he had to do cover it and move to a different place if he had to drink he never drank from 
where a well or a tap because he realized that's where the Nazis and the Ukrainians would set their ambushes. He would drink from the river. Then uh, fall approached. It, it became too cold to, uh, to stay outdoors and he had to look for uh, a new place. He ended up in, in, uh, in a village uh, called Ho Holotsinets and he knocked on some farmer's uh, door and said, I'm a Ukrainian boy, my parents were kidnapped, I'm looking for, you know, for some work. And that guy took him in. Uh, this is actually uh, the descendants of uh, this uh, farmer, Senek, who we met uh, when we were there in 2000. And... Um, yeah. Yeah, they speak Ukrainian, but I don't, I, don't, I don't really think it needs translation. Um, by then, the Nazis were already in full retreat. Uh, the Russians were closing in on them. And uh, one day, some of his friends showed up at uh, the farm where he stayed and, and urged him to come with him, uh, saying that there was a pogrom in a plantation in the village. That was a plantation where several dozen Jews uh, were employed as slave labor. Ukrainian farmers from the area uh, armed with uh, pitchforks and axes and sticks just, you know, went on a rampage there and all, killed almost everyone, uh, butchered them. So my father and his friends uh, went there, they dug graves and buried between 50 and 60 um, dead bodies. Uh, there were some wounded uh, women who were still alive and they loaded them on a cart and took them to the village of Klusta, um, where there was a German army camp, and I know it would sound bizarre, but they took actually the they went into the German army camp. The, the SS and the, the Gestapo were long gone by then. And, and the Wehrmacht doctor, the German doctor, actually attended to the wounded. And the German troops uh, kept the Ukrainians out because the Ukrainians wanted to go in and finish the job. Then um, the Russians, as I said, were closing in. 24 uh, fighter aircraft you know, appeared in the sky and they bombed the camp. And many of the Jews who managed to survive the Holocaust actually uh, died at, at that attack. How unfortunate. The, the, the Russians uh, uh, liberated the Chortkov, but then the Germans launched a counterattack. So the Russians retreated. And my father said, OK, I had enough with the Germans. I'm not staying here. And he ran with the Russians in deep snow. That was March. He ran for something like 100 miles um, just not to stay in town. Eventually, the Russians turned around and launched another attack, which was, uh, and they liberated Shortko for the, for the you know, last time. My father went to town, um, but then he fell sick. This is how a typhus uh, bug looks like. Um, and um, he had high fever, and you know, many, uh, many uh, Jews uh, died from typhus. Uh, that's very prevalent with, when uh, hygiene is very uh, poor. He was in the hospital for a few weeks. And then on the first day when he was back on his feet, uh, one of the wounded ladies he uh, rescued from that plantation in uh, Holotzenets came to him and said, where are you? Everybody's looking for you. What's going on? Well, this wolf guy who killed your father and brother was captured by the Russians and he was, um, he was being brought to trial. My father went there. This is the district court in Chortkov where the trial took place. My father was the only eyewitness and apparently it was a very convincing witness because the Russians convicted uh, the, uh, the guy and he was uh, hanged the next day. Um, this uh, can be a very long story on its own, but I will not uh, get into it. But my father and his friends did not stay in Chortkov. They started traveling all over Europe and they ended up eventually in uh, Prebitz in Germany uh, in a... In a um, uh, farm that was organized by messengers from the um, uh, Jewish settlement in Israel, preparing them for making Aliyah. Plebitz is very close to Nuremberg, so we also had the opportunity to go and, and this is uh, them during this uh, period. He also had an opportunity to go and watch the uh, Nuremberg trials. And then uh, February 3rd, 1947, uh, 18 uh, refugees and my father uh, were taken to a uh, port in France and boarded this uh, miserable uh, vessel 
It was later called the Ma'apila Almoni and tried to uh, sail to Israel. Uh, rough sea, this poor guy didn't even know how to swim. You know, it was the most uh, horrendous experience he had <laughs> after the Holocaust. Um, but they didn't make it uh, to Israel because the uh, British Navy caught them. This is a picture of uh, those Ma'apilim coming, getting out of the uh, ship and being sent to Cyprus. My father was actually very happy in a deportee camp in Cyprus, as you can see here. He spent there nine months. He said, I had my own bed. You know, they gave me food, cigarettes. Um, eventually, uh, he was allowed to uh, uh, make Aliyah. He, uh, December 47, he went to Israel. He joined uh, Tzahal. He fought in the uh, uh, war, war of independence. Um, and then in... Uh, 58, I think he joined the Shin Bet, where he spent his entire career. In 1971, uh, when he was serving in the Jewish in, in the Israeli embassy in uh, in Germany, um, he testified against this gentleman, uh, Richard Pal. We're not sure this is his picture, but that's what the Yad Vashem archive says. Uh, this guy was in charge of uh, looting all the Jewish uh, property in, in Charkov. Um, I want to finish with one last thing. This will only take a minute. This is a, a ceremony that took place uh, last year in Martef HaShoah in Jerusalem. And uh, my nephew, uh, Tome, uh, showed up unannounced. And uh, he had some things to say. So, כל אותם ערכים אשר אתה דוגל בהם ומחילנו. סבא, עברת תופת ואיבדת את כל היקר לך. אבל מתוך התופת הזאת קמת, עלית ארצה, הקמת מדינה. ואותנו חינכת למצוינות ופטריוטיות. אני גאה להיות לך לנכד ולהמשיך את המסורת של אהבת המדינה. Thank you for uh, sticking with me. Um, the more interesting part will start now, and uh, if you have any questions for my father, I'll try to translate. If you want to ask in Hebrew, I'll translate to English, whichever way. Ken <laughs> Lula. Hilly is asking whether the kids that he met, whether he was with them all the time. <laughs> My answer would be that, that many of these uh, kids from Chortkov remain, you know, some of his very, very best friends. Um, these are people that I know. Uh, unfortunately, some of them passed away over the last uh, couple of years. So what my father is saying is that during that period before the war ended, his, him and his friends, even though they were in the same area, some were hiding as Jews, some were pretending to be Ukrainians like him. So each one had like his own story or you know, his own arrangement. What I know is that they hooked up later. Please. visual journey. 
Germany as well as Rick's story. And the other question, did your father ever get in touch with his um, mother's sister or his brother? <laughs> קודם כל, מאיפה התמונות של המשפחה שיש לך, ואם אי פעם היית בקשר עם הדודה, עם הדודה שלך. את התמונה קיבלתי מהדודה, שהיא אחות של אימי, מארצות הברית, בניו יורק, והיום היא לא בחיים. The pictures actually came from that aunt of his. Those two pictures. The picture of his grandparents, of his parents on their wedding day, and of uh, him and his siblings. But because obviously he finished the war with nothing on him. Um, and this is the only remnant he has whatsoever from his family. Uh, she passed away in 1981. Did he meet her? He, he met her, I think, Let's go see. He, he met her once. I'll repeat it in, in English in a second. I'm not sure. The question was um, whether the, the Ukrainian farmer who gave my father refuge knew that he was Jewish and whether my father was trying to arrange for, for the farmer uh, to be acknowledged as Chassidu Mota Olam. How on earth do you say that? There you go. בשפה אוקראינית פרפקט, בהתחלה התקבלתי כאוקראיני לכל. עם הזמן הייתי עובד טוב, הייתי משנת אותו טוב, למרות שידעו שאני יהודי, התקבלתי אצלם כחלק מהמשפחה. What my father said was, was that initially they definitely did not know that he was uh, Jewish. My father introduced himself as a Ukrainian orphan whose uh, parents were kidnapped by the, by the Germans, uh, which wasn't anything unusual back then. And he also looked, you know, with his bright complexion, Aryan. And um, Later on, he, he believes that they did know that he was Jewish, and nonetheless, they accepted him as part of the family. But to your question, we, we never pursued that, uh, that uh, acknowledgement. <laughs> The answer is that he wasn't surprised. He knew that the Ukrainians hated us, hated Jews, you know, with vengeance. And they were the first one to start murdering Jews as soon as the Germans entered town. So he wasn't surprised at all. A, a, 
השאלה פה היא לגבי ה...